Hello, my name is Jonathan Clark. I'm also known as DJ Bolivia, and I'm going to do a, just a quick gear review today. Uh, I just bought a new MIDI controller, um, sort of a smaller one that I'm used to, uh, to be used portably on the road, because I'm going to be living in motels for the next 8-9 months. Uh, so what I got was the Oxygen 25. It's by a company called M-Audio. And I was initially reluctant to buy this controller because I had a M Audio sound card, uh, external USB based uh, audio interface once that died on me. So I was not pleased with M Audio, but I did do a lot of uh, research before I, online before I went out and bought this, and I saw a lot of really good reviews for it. So I thought I'll give them a second chance. So anyway, they have a couple different product lines and their Oxygen product line includes three different models, the 25, the 49, and the 61. And the, these numbers indicate how many keys are on the keyboard, or on the controller, I should say. So with, with music, looking at a piano, there's 12 notes in an octave. So when you take a number like the 25, 49, or 61, all it is is basically it goes a certain number of octaves plus it repeats that bottom key so uh, repeats the C key so a 25 is two octaves plus the extra C the 49 is four octaves plus the extra C and the 61 is five octaves plus the extra C and if you're trying to figure out what this means in comparison to a normal standard piano like a grand piano or an upright piano whatever those are all 88 keys and what those are is a total of seven octaves plus four extra keys. So usually a normal piano starts down with a low, low A and goes up to a high C. Okay, so I have not opened this controller yet. Um, so we're going to see what happens when that uh, comes out. Now this one, you can hear it kind of shakes. That's <laughs> That should be a little bit uh, nerve-wracking at first, but I think what it is, it's the uh, the beads in the in the little package of stuff that absorbs moisture. I think that's broken open inside, so hopefully that's the case. We'll find out. Anyway, looking at this, here's the back of the box. Um, the Auction 25 MIDI controller controls delivers next generation functionality from M Audio. Blah blah blah. Lots of nice marketing, um, fancy talk. Uh, direct link mode automatically maps controls to common DAW functions including transport mixer, track pan, and plug-in parameters. Um, the built-in factory presets offer support for popular virtual instruments right out of the box. And that's going to be good, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but it does, you can see on the box here it lists a few of them like X-Band, Hybrid, Velvet, Strike, Oddity, Imposter, Mini Monster. So, there's a bunch of preset things in here that will, depending on which software you're using for your audio editing, for your DAW, Disc Desktop Audio Workstation, um, there's different presets that will let you get up and running a little bit faster because it automatically configures some of the controls on this to what you use commonly in your DAW. Now, um, the three different Oxygen controllers, the 25, 49, and 61, they're very similar in a lot of respects. The 25, which I bought, is a little bit less uh, versatile, but the reason I got that, like I said, is I want to take this on the road. So I want something small, portable, easy to carry around on, uh, on flights through airports and stuff like that. So this one is uh, it's about 10 centimeters high off the desk, uh, that's 4 inches for people in the States, and its footprint is about 24 by 40 centimeters, so that's about 9 by 16 inches, so it's not huge. Um, I believe it will fit into my massive laptop carry-on bag with my laptop. So, so basically I'm going to need to be able to carry around this controller, plus my dedicated external sound card, which is a Focusrite um, 8i, 8i6 is what I'm using right now. That's the one I'm taking with me. I've got a couple of them. Uh, and I'm also going to need to carry my laptop, plus my power supply for my laptop, uh, my power supply for the Focusrite, for the sound card. Now there's no power supply for this Oxygen 25, for any of the Oxygens. 
because they derive their power from their USB connection to the laptop. So, if you're having problems with your uh, MIDI controller not showing up, once you've got it plugged in and it's not showing up in your preferences, in your audio software, stuff like that, it's possible that your USB port you're plugged into isn't quite supplying enough power. I've seen that happen before. So if that's the case, you might want to try going and plugging into a different USB port if your computer has several ports. Sometimes one of them might get a little bit weak and just doesn't work with a lot of stuff. So that's actually the case on my laptop right now. I've got four USB ports and one of them is terrible and barely works with anything. So check that. Um, if you've got um, a powered USB hub, you might be able to plug into that, but not a lot of people use those, I don't think, percentage-wise. Anyway, let's, um, let's open this up and then I'll keep talking. So, like I say, this is the first time I've the box for this unit. Oh yeah, I can see those little little beads from the Okay, so there's our USB cord and there's our silica gel which is leaking everywhere. Okay, always, always <coughs> save your box, save the manual, save everything, because you never know, you might want to take it back to the store and trade it in for a more impressive model, you might want to sell this to someone and upgrade. So basically what we've got, we've got a standard USB cable, I may as well open it. So you can see standard USB cable. I have some, uh, some manuals. M Audio Avid. Avid, yes. Avid makes Pro Tools. Okay, so there's some notes. A promo item. A promo item. Quick start guide. And is this the full manual? No, it's not. It's just the quick start guide. So I did look at the manual online before I um, before I bought this, and uh, it's it's pretty good. Okay, so let's look and see what we've got here. We've got I'm going to take this off. We've got the display. Uh, we have a total of eight programmable no knobs, MIDI knobs, and. Uh, those have a fair amount of resistance, those feel good. I like that. I've used quite a few different MIDI controllers, and so obviously I get a little... I get uh, preferences for the what I like about the feel of different knobs and sliders and stuff like that. Um, so here's a transport bar, six different MIDI push-button things, and those have quite a bit of resistance. That's probably a little bit more resistance than I'm used to on other controllers. Maybe more than I like, but I like the knobs. Uh, we have one slider. Lots of resistance there. That's good. That's not too loose. Um, the other two keyboards, the 49 and the 61, they each have a total of nine sliders. And so when you hook this up, I mentioned earlier that it, it um, talks automatically to certain DAWs. Um, when you hook this up, the default is for this slider to connect to the master volume. And if you are using one of the ones with nine sliders, one of the other two models, then the first eight default to the first eight tracks, I believe, in your mix window, and the one on the right, the ninth one, would be your, the equivalent to this, which would tie into the master volume. Okay. We have a pitch bend knob. Oh, that's nice. I like that. That's, that's stiffer. It feels more solid than the uh, other ones I've been using lately. Oh, the mod wheel, very, very loose. Now the difference between the two of these, if you look at it, when I let go of the mod wheel, it stays in the same place as where I left it off. Pitch bend, on the other hand, you let go, and it springs back in place into the middle. Okay. Well, that's nice. 
Okay, so we have a 25 key keyboard from a C to a C. So normally you would probably want to assume that that's a middle C, the equivalent of middle C, C3. Um, but that may not necessarily need to be the case. If you're writing music, doing production work, you may want to work on the low end first, the bass. And if that's the case, you can use your um, the transpose octave keys. And so you can shift things down, which means that instead of this being C3, if I shift it down one, basically the numbers are going to move up, which has the effect of making the keys lower. So that if I press that once, this would become C3, which means this is C2 and this is C1. And so if you're doing production work with like a GM, a general MIDI uh, drum kit, for instance, um, if you start off, if that happens to be C3, actually I'm not positive about that, but I assume that's the case. So if you start off with this at C3, and your general MIDI, the main eight, nine keys that you use, they would be down here on the C1 to B1 octave, which is off the, uh, off the keyboard right now. But if I press that, shifting it up, then that would be C1, so that would be your kick drum, C sharp 1, D1, so one of those would be your snare drum, depending which implementation you're using. Um, things like your um, your hi-hats are probably probably on these two keys, maybe these two keys, stuff like that. Anyway, so transposing lets you shift, and uh, so you could do all your bass work, and then you could transpose a couple octaves, and you'd be in a higher pitch for doing work on your pads or synths or leads or something. Uh, what else? Okay, so eight assignable knobs, faders, six buttons on a transport. And, and going back to the transport, that's these buttons are probably not going to be used commonly um, for general MIDI work. Those will probably be used more specifically when you're using this with a D DAW, specifically for a transport bar. Okay, now in theory, any MIDI control can be assigned to almost any function in almost any DAW. Um, for example, something unconventional, let's say you had an on-off switch on one of your controls in Ableton, you could probably assign your fader so that when it's above the middle value, it means it's on, and below the middle value is that it's off. You could also have a push button where it toggles between on and off, on and off. Or you could have a knob so that anything left of 12 o'clock is off, anything right of 12 o'clock is on. That just shows the flexibility of assigning different types of MIDI controls to, to uh, certain instruments or certain functions in a DAW. Now, so, but going back to this, these six buttons for the, uh, six controls for the, in the transport layout, that's probably most commonly going to be used specifically when you're interfacing with a DAW. Now, I mentioned that there is some software called Direct Link from M-Audio, which basically gives you different default maps to, um, to different DAWs. Now, let me backtrack for a second. This controller is, it's called a class compliant controller. And what that means is when you plug it in to your um, computer via the USB cord, then it does not need drivers to be installed for it to work. You don't have to install drivers. Okay, and the reason for that is because class compliant devices have drivers already stored on the operating system that will work to run this and any other class compliant devices. Now, having said that, if you're using Mac, OS X, whatever, the class compliant drivers should cover you for everything. If you're using Windows, and I'll clarify that the user manual for this is still talking about XP and Vista, uh, it's not upgraded to talking about Windows 7 and 8, but 7 and 8 generally can do anything that the others could do. So with Windows, if you want to do a couple specific things, you need to go to the M-Audio website and download an updated driver above and beyond the generic 
class compliant driver that would make this work. So class compliant driver for Windows already built into your computer. You just plug this in, it's going to work. But if you are going to use this keyboard with multiple apps at the same time, so you've got a couple of different DAWs running in different windows, then you have to have the updated driver that you download from the M-Audio website. Also, if you are going to use multiple devices, multiple class compliant devices at the same time, say you've got this which is class compliant and you've got another controller also class compliant, if you want to use them both simultaneously, you have to down on Windows, you have to download the updated driver to make your computer see them as different devices. Okay, so that's important. And to be honest, it's probably a smart idea with any device that if there's a more recent or better driver available online, just go download it and use it automatically instead of whatever. You know, because these pieces of equipment, sometimes they started manufacture a couple years ago, so they've got very outdated drivers packaged with the equipment, and of course there's been lots of updates, and things will work better with the most recent drivers usually. Um, the USB on this particular device um, is it's a 2.0 connection, so it will work with all 2.0 USB ports. It should work with all 3.0 ports, although you will not have the advantage of higher speed. But in a situation like this, where 2.0 gives you enough speed to, to make a controller work, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, this is also backwards compatible with 1.0 USB ports. Uh, sorry, 1.1 USB ports. And that may be important for some older computers, although nowadays it's pretty, you know, not a lot of people are running with USB 1.1 ports anymore. It's all, it's all 3.0 nowadays, and, and there's still a lot of legacy 2.0 ports out there. Um, my laptop, as an example, has two USB 2.0 ports and two 3.0 ports. Uh, so drivers, yeah, if you're on Windows, you don't need to download a driver, but not a bad idea if you get the more up-to-date driver from the website. And also, I should point out, this is one of the deficiencies with the 25 compared to the 49 and 61. If you have multiple devices, like say I was performing in a band, and I was setting up for a live show, and let's say that I had three different keyboards set up, with the 49 or the 61, there is a device ID function, which means your software can target individual devices. So basically, if I want to have three different keyboards, I do not want the 25. I want either the 49 or 61, because with those, each device has the unique name, and so your software can see them as three separate entities. Okay, you can't hook up multiple 25s to your DAW and have them all work properly and you know for the DAW to identify each one individually. So that's that's a possible well that, that could be important for both a performing musician and also for studio production. But with studio production you're more likely to be just using the same keyboard controller over and over again. Whereas with performing live you're more likely to want multiple keyboards. Okay? So what else is on this? Looking at the back, we have a, oh, that's a Kensington security lock port, if you happen to use those. Power switch, on, off. Uh, oh, this is nice. This is for a sustain pedal. And something you'll have to pay attention to is whenever you turn this unit on, or a lot of controllers, that's when it does the polarity check to look to see if there's a sustain pedal and if so, what uh, polarity position it's in. So it assumes when you boot up a thing, boot up a controller, if there's a sustain pedal plugged in, it assumes that you're not holding it down. So that's how it figures out the default of not on versus when you press the pedal on. If you happen to be standing on your sustain pedal when you turn on this unit, then the sustain note on 
will only work when you take your foot off the pedal. And the off will only work when you put your foot back on the pedal. So it completely reverses it. So basically the short, the moral of the story is don't stand on your sustain pedal when you turn on any piece of equipment ever. Okay? And then of course there's the USB connection port. That end goes in there, the other end goes to your computer. Um, what other features of this are there? Okay, so this and the and the other two, the 49 and 61, also have seven different velocity curves built into the thing as as uh, defaults. So I can use my uh, I can use my controls, go through this, and there are four of them, which are on the on the LED readout. There's C1, C2, C3, and C4. And these all relate to variable velocity curves. And what this means is, um, there's the C2 is the standard one, the default, when you power up. And so that's just what you would expect out of a keyboard. Now, let me, let me backtrack for a second. Okay, I should have mentioned, this has velocity sensitive keys. Which means, the harder you hit the keys, the higher the velocity is going to be in the MIDI message that is sent to your DAW. And velocity levels, if you're not familiar with all this, velocity levels are what control, in a sense, control the volume. Okay? So, when you play this keyboard, because it is touch sensitive, or has variable velocity, the harder you hit it, the higher the velocity signal will be that goes to your computer, translating to a louder note. So if you have a keyboard that's not touch sensitive or not variable velocity, it doesn't matter if you press it very softly or hit it very hard, you're always going to get a constant volume out of your uh, notes. But with a touch sensitive one, playing softly will give you soft notes, playing hard will give you more volume. Okay, So if you're doing production, to be honest, you should never ever buy a keyboard that is not touch sensitive. And I understand five, ten years ago that it made a big cost difference. It was very expensive to build keyboards that were, or controllers that were touch sensitive. But with technology today, there is simply no excuse for buying a keyboard, or even for producing a keyboard, that's not touch sensitive. Um, so that's one of the first things to look for when you buy a controller. Don't get one that is not touch sensitive. End of story, it's a waste of money. Okay? Um, so, so anyway, back to the velocity curves. Uh, the standard is C2, but you can also set different curves, which means that if you have a very hard touch, like say when you play the keys, it's just the way you play, you always hit them pretty hard and the velocity values that are being produced are higher than you would like. You'd like to scale them down a little bit. And instead of trying to learn to play softer, you can use a different curve that, when you hit it hard, gives you softer velocities that get fed to your DAW. Or vice versa, if you're a very dainty person and you don't feel comfortable hitting your controller hard, you can have it scaled so that your softer hits actually produce a higher velocity to go to your controller. So there's four different levels there. There are also three different levels which emulate the old controllers which are not touch sensitive. Um, that's not necessarily useful if you're trying to play the piano and trying to have a realistic sound or playing a lot of different instruments and you're aiming for realism. But if you're doing certain types of programming, like especially with techno, EDM, that sort of stuff, um, a lot of the drum machines, drums used in that sort of stuff, does not have velocities that vary. They're constant velocities. And it's just a, uh, it's just a characteristic of the way that um, the early drum uh, machines, like the TR-808, the 909, stuff like that, and the 303, um, not all drum machines, but different, different synthesizers, um, they often would output one single velocity the whole time, and so certain styles of music, genres of music, developed where it was characteristic not to have those varying velocities. So, you know, if I'm producing 
if I'm programming drums or something like that and trying to produce realistic sounding drums for a pop song, for a indie alternative rock song or something like that, then I do want those variations in velocity because that will make it sound more like a human drummer. But if I'm programming techno, I may want boom, 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 always constant, exactly the same velocity. So there are three velocity curves on this and on the other two oxygen controllers. Um, C1 always outputs at um, 64 for velocity. C2, sorry, F1 always outputs at 64. F2 always outputs at 100. And F3 always outputs at the highest value, 127. So if you understand MIDI, you'll know exactly what I mean by that. Okay, uh, this, this controller has a non-volatile memory, which means it saves the presets and it saves controller and channel assignments when it's powering down. So if you've done all sorts of stuff and you want to reset it to the factory state, you hold down the plus and the minus keys when you're powering up, and that does a factory reset. Okay. Uh, I talked about direct link very briefly. I said that you can set this up so it automatically um, configures itself to match certain DAWs, and it covers... Okay, first of all, that is not covered in your class-compliant drivers built into your system. So if you, for example, use Pro Tools, and you want to have this automatically map to the standard set of controls in Pro Tools, then what you have to do is go to the M Audio website and download the specific um, the executable, whatever it is, to let your controller talk to your DAW using this standard setup. Okay, it's free. It's very. It doesn't take very long to do this. So just search M Audio, search Direct Link. And the, the six DAWs that are supported right now are Pro Tools, Cubase, Ableton, um, Logic, GarageBand, and the propeller head stuff, so Reason and Record. Um, and, and that probably represents, I'm sure, represents about 97% of all production work these days. Uh, if you've got another software suite that DAW that doesn't, um, that isn't on that list, you can still use this, absolutely. The only difference is that you have to go in and you have to MIDI map and program it, assign controls to functions in your DAW manually, okay? So if you've done this before, you realize this is not a difficult task at all, um, but it does take a few minutes. Um, so you may want to go with those uh, direct link presets uh, to make things easier, but uh, even, like say if you wanted to use Pro Tools and you didn't want to download the direct link, you could still MIDI map stuff individually, um, same with any of them. So the direct link presets are not critical, but you may find them quite handy, especially if you're using one of those 668Ws. I haven't used this yet, like I say, so I'm going to try it out uh, before I finish the video. Uh, apparently this weighs approximately just over 1.5 kilograms, if you're in the States, just under 4 pounds. So it's definitely pretty portable. It should not, uh, I mean, it's, its density is low, so it should not contribute significantly to going, putting you over your limit on your overnight bag, or on your... Uh, whatever you call it, your carry-on bag on airplanes. Now I did note the box said that, uh, you know, this is perfect for working on a plane, in motel rooms, stuff like that. Well, I, I hope it works well in motel rooms. That's my point in buying it. But uh, as far as using it on a plane, I don't know about you, but uh, I suspect that the only people that really use keyboards for producing music on planes are DJs and producers that make way more money and are way more famous than myself or any of you um, and who can afford to fly first class on planes because I have I fly a lot and you know I sit in economy that's where I can afford to sit and most of the planes that I've been on I have a hard time even opening my laptop while I'm and working on that so I can't see this being the sort of thing that you're going to use on a plane but you know at least it's light and it's portable uh, 
Price-wise, this thing right now in Canada, and American prices should be very similar, because our dollar is almost a parity right now. Uh, in Canada, this one's $99. The Oxygen 49 is $149, $149. The Oxygen 61 is $199, and that's come down a lot recently. And those are prices from Amazon, so shipped to you, even if you live in the rural outback, like I do. Um, what else? Oh, this ships with Ableton Lite. Now, this, right now, I'm using 9, sweet, um, and the version that's shipped with this is version 8 Lite, so it's a little bit behind the times. Um, maybe newer versions soon will start shipping with 9 Lite, who knows. Now, in other videos I've mentioned that there's only three versions of Ableton. There's the intro, there's the standard, and then there's the suite. And most people can do sort of minimal work with even the intro version. I, I would recommend for most people that are starting out to go with the uh, standard version. Unless you're doing advanced music production, then you're definitely going to want the sweet version with all the extra capabilities and uh, extra tracks, extra effects, extra send returns, all that sort of stuff. Um, but anyway, so there's three versions in theory, but there's actually four versions of Ableton. And the reason they don't advertise this is because they don't sell the light version, and the light version is what came with this. So, so why is there the difference? Well, if you get the light version for free when you buy this, or, you know, there's quite a bit of hardware out there now that Ableton gives the light version of. If you want to upgrade from the light version to get the intro version off the Ableton website, it's actually a free upgrade. So basically, it's almost like you're getting the intro version. And that's a good thing, because if you decide that you want to buy Ableton, uh, the sweet version, or something like that, then you're going to have a huge bonus if you get this, because upgrading from the intro version to the sweet version is a lot cheaper than going out and buying the sweet version as a standalone product. So basically, if you're looking at buying Ableton 9 Suite, then you may as well buy this controller because it's going to give you a discount off getting Ableton 9 anyway, which basically pays for the controller. Um, now, the exact savings that you uh, realize varies from country to country, and it varies from time to time, depending on the versions and whatnot, but definitely a good idea. And the only thing I will clarify as a, as a minor potential headache or horror story is that some people have got the light version for free in equipment like this. They have upgraded their light version to a more recent light version. So let's say that you're on 9.1 shipped in the box, or I guess this is 8. So let's say this is 8.1 shipped in the box and you upgrade to 8.4 of the light version, which is free. You cannot upgrade from an upgraded version of the light up to the intro. So, if you are going to get the intro version, make sure you do it directly from what gets shipped in the box before you just go up the, up the light chain. So switch to the intro version right away. Then, if you want to buy the standard version or the sweet version, you can upgrade from the intro to the standard or sweet and save yourself some money. It's, it's, it's a compelling, it's a, it's a good investment that way, for sure. Okay, so I think that's about all that I really want to say about this right now. I will go into, I'll, I'll hook it up to my laptop, play with it a little bit, and give you a little bit more feedback on the responsiveness of the keys and stuff. But basically, I've covered all the features. Um, you can do all kinds of stuff like this. You can, you can um, map it to, like, say you're using Ableton Live. You can map it so different trees, t sorry, different keys trigger different clips within Ableton, um, which is kind of neat, uh, especially in a live performance situation. And of course, if you know Ableton Live well, you realize that you can, um, looking looking at the program in the bottom left of any clip, 
if you're if you're in waveform view at the bottom instead of in the effects window pane on the far bottom left you've got a couple letters like you've got E to turn on or turn off the envelope view one of them is L so if you've got that turned on then you can see that there are different clip behaviors for launching clips um, and for any specific clip there's four different behaviors so you can trigger a clip in Ableton with this by pressing down a key you can have on this keyboard you could have 25 different clips each triggered by a different key on this and there's different trigger modes like for instance um, trigger when you press it, it once it launches the clip if you press the key again it keeps going but it relaunches the clip and just keeps playing but back from the start there's toggle mode and what that does the first time you press the key it launches the clip if you press the same key a second time it stops the clip so it goes between on and off instead of between on and restart and restart uh, the third mode third mode is gate and with gate what happens is the clip plays until you let go of the key and then it stops so if you had say a 30 second sample and you held down the key um, that triggered it for 12 seconds then it'll play the first 12 seconds of the sample and when you let go it'll stop playing it and of course this is subject to the quantization value because if you have quantization turned off for that particular clip when you let go it'll stop playing immediately in gate mode but if you have quantization turned on when you let go it'll continue to the beginning of the next quantization interval if that makes sense and the last mode is repeat um, and so what happens is if you've got quantization for the clip off it works like trigger mode but if you have quantization on and you hold the key down it keeps playing the first part of the clip based on the quantization amount repeatedly until you let go and then it will continue playing the clip through so for example, if I had a 6 bar clip, I had the quantization value set to 1 quarter, 1 quarter note. If I press the key to trigger it, it will keep repeating that first beat over and over again until I let go of the key and then it will continue playing through to the end of the 6 bars. So that's kind of neat, that's not really related to this particular piece of equipment, but it's good if you do use Ableton uh, and don't know that that capability is there, that any keyboard controller, including this one, gives you the capability to do that sort of stuff. Okay, so that's about all for now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go hook this up to the computer, play with it for a while, and then we'll finish the video. Okay, so one thing I didn't clarify earlier in the video, I'm sure most of you realize this if you understand what a MIDI controller is, but a controller does not actually produce music itself. It only sends out MIDI information, control data, notes, so that something else externally, like either a software synthesizer or an external hardware synthesizer, whatever, can produce music, can produce noise. Okay, so this keyboard does not actually produce sound by itself. There's no speakers, there's no speaker outs. All there is is a USB line that goes into my computer, and I'm routing my MIDI data out of this, and at the moment I'm routing it through Pro Tools, and it's going through the Mini Grand Piano setting to make noise. Okay, but by itself, if you just buy this, you're not getting noise out of this. Okay, it has to be interfacing with some sort of audio software or something like that to get the noise. Um, also, one thing important that I forgot to mention earlier, you probably noticed there's no MIDI output on this in terms of the standard old-fashioned MIDI 5 pin cables. So when I'm hooking this up to my laptop, I'm doing it directly through USB, I'm not sending the MIDI out to my sound card first and then from the sound card in through its USB cable into my laptop. Okay, so that's an important distinction. Um, anyway, I've been playing with this for a little while now and I like it. The keys are awesome. The keys are very, very good. 
responsive. Um, I'll just play here for a minute, and you can see what I mean. And this is not copyrighted music, this is just random chords. So you can see it, it performs very well. Um, I do have a Roland sustain pedal hooked up to it at the moment. Um, you can probably hear that, and it works fine. Um, so for $99, I would say that you cannot go wrong. This is uh, definitely a good working unit so far. Obviously, I've only had it for a few hours. Um, but I'm going to put it to the extensive test. I'm about to go on the road for the next eight or nine months or so, away from home, living in motels. And this is what I'm taking with me, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with it, so I think it's going to work out well. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you uh, want to learn more about other gear reviews, other DJing stuff, production videos, I've done all sorts of stuff. Um, Ableton, different types of software, Pro Tools, stuff like that, DJ equipment, all sorts of stuff. I'll put a link on the screen here in just a second, and you can go to my website and see the full list of videos that I've got online on YouTube. So hopefully you check them out. And if you found this useful and want to learn more about other upcoming video reviews that I put up, um, you can follow me on Twitter at DJ Bolivia. But anyway, thanks for watching and have a good time, good time uh, with whatever equipment you're using. Cheers.